What's up guys, Tommy Bowyer here from Move Rewind and today I will be reviewing Doctor Who Series 9. There will be spoilers in this review, so without further ado, let's get into it. Doctor Who Series 9 stars Peter Capaldi as the 12th incarnation of the Doctor and Jenna Coleman as his companion Clara Oswald. It aired from the 19th of September 2015 and concluded after 12 episodes on the 5th of December 2015. It is the 5th series to be overseen by head writer and executive producer Stephen Moffat and at the time critics claimed that this was the best series of the revival era. Now in this review we attempt to see whether that statement is true or not. Series 9 is a hit and miss series for me. Some parts of it I really enjoy and other parts I hate with a passion. When I first saw it in 2015, I honestly came away thinking, I think I'm done with Doctor Who because I just didn't enjoy this series at all. Having rewatched it several years later, I have to say I have a renewed appreciation to what they were trying to do. And some of the individual episodes in series nine are great. It's just a shame that the series story arc throughout is so poor and it's so unsatisfying by the series conclusion that it leaves you just feeling a bit flat after watching it. Now there are fantastic things in series 9. First and foremost, Peter Capaldi as the 12th Doctor. He's amazing. He makes some pretty lacklustre scripts work just through the passion he has for portraying this character in his performances, in his delivery. He's a fantastic actor and Series 9 shows his great talents as the 12th Doctor. Now I'm not of course 100% happy with what they did with the Doctor during this series. For some reason they characterise him slightly different. He comes across as this kind of mad uncle rather than the more complex character we got to know in Series 8. Which is a little disappointing I wish that they had continued down that more questionable route because I think that would have just been interesting and taken the program into more unknown territories bringing it back to the more standard the doctor's quite quirky and still quite a lovable character I don't know it's been done before so it just felt a bit kind of Moffat was you know just kind of run of the mill in terms of the doctor's characterization Clara Oswald who's the companion for this series I rate Jenna Coleman as an actor, she's amazing, she does an amazing job with this series, however, Clara should not have been the companion in series 9 because there is nowhere for her character to go and I feel like Stephen Moffat knew that because he doesn't really give her any characterization. I mean she's made to be quite arrogant and the idea of this series is Clara is getting a bit above her station, she's becoming very arrogant thinking that she can deal with all these problems herself without the Doctor. The problem with doing a story arc like that is you make the character very unlikable and I think that rubbed off on a lot of people because a lot of people including myself in series 9 found Clara unbearable in quite a number of scenes. So the main story arc for series 9 is the hybrid, the idea that the Time Lords and another warrior race have conceived this hybrid and there's all questions about what this hybrid is. It doesn't get resolved, which I think is what lets series 9 down because this hybrid storyline literally goes anywhere. Um, in the final episode they just forget about it and say oh it doesn't really matter. So I think series 9 has some great episodes, some great performances, let down by having a companion who was really just vacant on any characterization and a story arc which didn't seem to go anywhere. To start off the series 9 episodes we have the 2014 Christmas special Last Christmas. Now for me Last Christmas is Moffat's best Christmas episode. It's such an engaging and enjoyable watch. It's one of those episodes which I can put in again and again and still find new things to appreciate about it. Now the idea of Last Christmas is that there's these dream crabs which are taking hold of the Dr. Clara and a bunch of people on this base and they have to try and figure out firstly who is in a dream and who isn't and secondly how to get the better of these dream crabs. It's a very engaging script. The idea that these dream crabs are slowly killing you adds a lot of urgency to this episode. I love the Doctor and Clara in this episode. It says a lot about their relationship. I love the quiet moments between them where they start 
being honest with one another, with the Doctor finally informing Clara that he didn't find Gallifrey and Clara informed the Doctor that Danny's actually dead. I also love the dream sequences in which we see Clara and Danny at Christmas and Clara dreaming about the kind of Christmas she would have wanted with Danny. It makes his death that more touching, seeing what could have been. The side characters introduced in this episode on the base are really well developed. I understand all of their characterizations. I know exactly why they're reacting in the way they do in certain situations. And of course, the elephant in the room, as the Doctor would say, is Nick Frost as Santa Claus. Now, I think a lot of people write off this episode because they're like, well, oh, Santa Claus is in it. It's a dumb concept. But it's because it's a dumb concept that it works. Santa Claus doesn't exist in the Doctor Who universe. He exists in this dream world. And that's great. That's the only reason Santa Claus could work in this episode. And Nick Frost, he's having a whale of a time with this performance. So I've got to love Santa Claus's performance because Nick Frost just brings the character to life. I love the ending of this episode. It has a great twist with the Doctor finally realising that actually none of them are all, none of them are on this base. It's been a dream all along and they've actually never met in the real world before. So I thought that was a good twist. And of course, Santa's sleigh taking them off as they all wake up from their dreams. It's just such a festive and upbeat way to end the special. It's one of those things which Doctor Who could only really get away with at Christmas. And then we have a very touching moment between the Doctor and an aged Clara, where they appear to be parting ways. Now, a lot of you may know that this was actually supposed to be where Clara's story came to an end. And if it did, I think this would have been a superb send-off to the character. But of course, Jenna Coleman decided she wanted to stay on, so Moffat had to quickly shoehorn in that the Doctor was actually dreaming again, so he comes to meet a younger version of Clara. Now this is one of those times where I think Last Christmas was, is rated very high for me. It would be rated even higher if Clara didn't turn out to be young and the Doctor and her go off travelling. But that doesn't take away any of the praise that I give this episode. I adore Last Christmas. It's a fun and engaging episode and it's something different and that's always what I'm looking for. Doctor Who to give me something different and unique. The Magician's Apprentice. Great opening but it just goes downhill from there. I love the opening cliffhanger of this episode with the Doctor rescuing this small boy from a battlefield only to discover that it's a child Davros. And this is one of those very if you saw uh, a dictator when they were a kid, do you have a right to kill that dictator before they grow up and do all the terrible things that they're going to do? So that concept is kind of told to death in this episode. But for me, The Magician's Apprentice is a lot of setup. There's a lot of we need to go and find the Doctor, where the hell is the Doctor, with Clara, Unit, and even Missy returning to try and locate the Doctor. Now, I have mixed feelings about that aspect of the episode because it does feel like a lot of setup. Like, we know they're going to find the Doctor eventually. It just so happens that we have to wait around about 20 minutes for them to get the plot going. Now, things I like about The Magician's Apprentice... Missy's back. Michelle Gomez once again kills it in the role, so I'm glad she's back. I also like scenes between her and Clara. I think they do work well together, even if sometimes it can get a bit boring. Um, now, they do a lot with the Doctor in this episode. The Doctor's characterization is completely transformed. He now has a guitar. He appears to be a bit more laid back, a bit more eccentric, not as dark as he was in Series 8. And for me, that was a letdown. I think this is the episode which transformed the 12th Doctor into a more light-hearted Doctor, like the 10th and 11th Doctor. So for me, that was a little bit of a disappointment. Where this episode starts getting going is when they get on Scarrow. I like the conversations between the Doctor and Davros. I think they're really good. And I love the cliffhanger to this episode with Missy and Clara and the TARDIS appearing to be destroyed. So there are decent things about this episode which I enjoy. However, for the most part, this is just a lot of setup, which, you know, you can expect from a two-part, but in this it's, of course, a bit more on the nose that they're just setting up stuff for the next episode. The Witch is Familiar has some good moments undermined by the conclusion. I love Davros in this episode. I think the actor has an opportunity to show a more complex side of Davros. I love the conversation between him and the Doctor. I have mixed feelings about Davros being able to see because, I don't know, I'm just not a massive fan of that. 
But the dialogue between the Doctor and Davros is really good. Even though they're enemies, they still have a degree of respect for one another and can be civil to one another in a time of need, which I like. But that's as far as it goes. I'm not a massive fan of Clara and Missy's scenes. I like the tension between them, but I don't know, something about them together just doesn't work. I find Missy a pretty annoying throughout most of this episode, which is a shame because I love Michelle Gomez in the role. Now, the Doctor being able to use regeneration energy to bring Davros back to an extent is an interesting idea. But I hate the fact that Davros ends up tricking the Doctor into reviving him and all of the Daleks. For the simple reason, it undermines the lovely conversation we just had between the Doctor and Davros. I think this episode would have been better if Davros had actually died. I think that would have been the more surprising way to go. Because obviously I think most people knew that the Davros was going to trick the Doctor. So... Stephen Moffat would have been better off actually killing the character off because that would have been more surprising. I hate the way the Daleks are defeated in this episode. If it was like an anti-climax, having all of the so-called dead Daleks revived from the sewer and they just start attacking all of the other Daleks, I'm not a fan of that. I just, I, th I think it's such a stupid way to end things that, you know, I feel like Moffat didn't really know how to finish this story, so just decided... Oh, we'll just uh, we'll just kill them off with dead Daleks. Yeah, weren't a fantastic way to um, finish this story. <laughs> I have to admit, I like how we see a variety of Daleks in this episode. There's a lot of um, nostalgia and you know f and f Easter eggs and things like that if you pay attention. So that was decent. I hate Clara being in the Tard in the Dalek. Now, for me, this scene undermines what the Daleks are, because the Dalek isn't just the casing, the Dalek is the mutant inside. So having Clara in a Dalek casing and Missy just telling her, oh yeah, uh, when the Daleks say nice things, it comes out as exterminate. I, I hate that, it just undermines what the Daleks are. So yeah, there are some things I enjoy about this episode, but there is a lot of stuff I don't like. Plus, I think that the ending is a bit of an anticlimax. Under the Lake, a traditional base under sea story with a fantastic mystery thrown in for good measure. I adore this story. From the moment it starts, I am fully immersed in this world. Having an underwater base creates a lot of claustrophobic moments. It feels very closed in. You can feel all of the characters getting more nervous and more frightened as this episode goes on. I love all the side characters. They're all well developed. You completely understand where each of them are coming from. I also love that there's a deaf character in this. Um, they're included very well. And I think that's just a great idea that they had a deaf character in this episode. It just works so well. The ghosts have a very creepy design. I love how they don't say anything, that they just follow people around and try and kill them. The idea of having this base have a day and night function means that there is intense moments because obviously these ghosts only come out at night. So you know during the night scenes that it's all going to just rev up a gear. So I love I love the, how they included day and night scenes in this episode. This episode has a decent cliffhanger as well, with the Doctor appearing as a ghost, and it appears that the Doctor is dead. Now, this was at a time when they liked killing off the Doctor, or at least teasing that the Doctor weren't going to survive the story. I never thought for a second that the Doctor, you know, would, su would survive, but it was a decent cliffhanger. Um, I also like Clara. This is one of those episodes during Series 9 which I find Clara not as arrogant. Um, she comes across pretty down to earth, which is what's needed from a companion. So I like Clara in these, these two episodes. Probably some of the only episodes in Series 9 I actually like the character of Clara. Before the Flood, one of those episodes in which the show tackles time travel, which sounds weird because Doctor Who is a time travel show. But I love that this episode tackles time travel. The idea that the Doctor has to constantly um, go back into his own time stream in order to try and find out details that he missed. I think that was very interesting and very well, uh, clear, cleverly written script, which is always a good thing to have in an episode. I love that this is one of those episodes in series nine, which is quite rare, where the Doctor's morals are questioned. You have the character of O'Donnell, who is killed during this episode. 
And while her teammate is clearly devastated, the doctor doesn't seem to care that much. He's just like, well, we just need to get on with it. There's no point. You know, she's dead. You've got to move on. I love how this episode highlights that the 12th Doctor is still an alien. He's still a bit unapproachable. No matter what they do with the character of this Doctor in Series 9, there are moments when you can clearly see some of Series 8 in there, which is always a good thing. The Fisher King is a very intimidating villain. I love the design of this character and it's great that him and the Doctor appear to be on equal footing throughout most of this episode. Having the Doctor and Clara in different time periods adds um, an extra level of tension in this episode, especially as Clara has to inform the Doctor that, look, you're a ghost here. That must mean that you die. And the Doctor has to try and contemplate his own demise and how that is going to happen. So I think it's great how this episode uses time travel by having the Doctor and his companion in different time zones. The Doctor having to cause the flood. It was the perfect way to end this episode um, because obviously they, they love making everything tie up all the loose ends. So having the Doctor having to cause the Flood to destroy the Fisher King, it was a great way to end this episode. Plus, it was a decent twist having the Doctor's ghost actually be a hologram. I thought that was a decent twist and one when I first saw it, I didn't really see coming. So Toby Whitehouse, the writer of this episode, he outdid himself. And I think this is when I began to fall in love with... Toby Whitehouse scripts because they're just so unique. They always give you something different and they always keep you on the edge of your seat. The Girl Who Died. Oh, this is where Series 9 started going downhill. The Girl Who Died has one of the most camp atmospheres I have ever seen in an episode of Doctor Who. It borders on the line of parody. The villain in this episode is horrible. The actor portrays this character so over the top that you feel like you're watching a pantomime. And I hate how this villain is defeated. Because basically this villain is targeting um, a Viking town. And the Vikings and the Doctor decide to defeat him by using electric eels to create a hologram. And these electric eels come out of nowhere. They're just like, oh, we have electric eels. Of course you do. So <laughs> Shoot them up then. It's just so stupid. The way this villain is defeated is terrible. And this villain's supposed to be a, a, like a really strong warrior race. Well, they don't come across like that at all. They come across just like as pantomime as it comes. So yeah, I hated the villain in this episode. Let down the episode as a whole. And of course, we have the character of a shielder. Portrayed by Maisie Williams, of course, at the time Maisie Williams was, you know, Game of Thrones fame, so everyone was talking about how Maisie Williams was in an episode of Doctor Who. Now, I have to ask you, if the character of his shielder was portrayed by anyone else besides Maisie Williams, would you even remember this character's name? I think the answer is no, as shielder is a very boring character. She's a, just a, a, a blank slab of wood. Um, there is nothing that makes this character stand out. I cannot understand for the life of me why the Doctor, out of everyone he's travelled with or everyone he's coming to contact to, decides to save a shielder. The only good thing about this episode is the Doctor remembering um, his face from the fires of Pompeii and saying, you know, I, I this is why I can save people. I know why I've got this sa face. It's because it shows when I actually saved someone. So apart from that one scene, this episode is terrible. Honestly, one of the worst in modern Who. The Woman Who Lived. A slight improvement on the girl who died, but that's not saying a lot. Maisie Williams, who portrayed a shielder, is now a character known as M. And I have to admit, M does get a little bit more development than a shielder did with M backstory as a mother I think there's stuff which could have been explored there and I like how the doctor has the face up to the consequences of allowing this person to live for so long to basically live till the end of time I think that was a great idea which shows how the doctor no matter how good his intentions doesn't always get it right and doesn't always have the right to do what he does so I felt like that was some interesting commentary but apart from that the majority of this episode is just boring it's just scenes between the Doctor and M, and they get old quite quickly. The villain of this episode, who M is uh, teaming up with, is is rubbish. Um, you know he's going to 
uh, to b betray humanity. You just can see it coming, and he's defeated in a very rubbish way as well. So, yeah, the woman who lived, as I said, a slight improvement on what came before, but still not very good. Um, I feel sorry for Maisie Williams, because Maisie Williams is a talented actor, and I feel like they could have done stuff with the character of M. It's just a shame in this episode, much like the last one, they didn't do anything with her. The Zygon Invasion is a very intense episode. It quickly develops this kind of thriller and espionage vibe, which just works with a more earthbound story. I love that this episode gives characters in units such as Kate Stewart and Osgood something to do. It's good to see them involved in the plot. Sometimes it's great to just see the Doctor have a team, like have a lot of backup, and this episode utilizes unit very, very well. I love how you're constantly wondering who is and who is not a Zygon, because obviously the Zygons are shapeshifters, so you're constantly wondering throughout this episode, are they actually human or is that a Zygon? Because they're doing some questionable stuff. I think this episode highlights how when you make a peace deal, there are always those on both sides who don't want peace. They just want war. They're never happy with any form of compromise, which I think that just reflects real life because we've seen it in contemporary conflicts as well as throughout history. There's always those who are just not happy with compromise on any occasion. They just want complete and total control. And I think that's really established in the Zygon invasion, how there's Zygons who are just not happy with the peace deal and just want an all out war. They want the planet for themselves or not at all. Of course, you know that Clara is a Zygon. Um, the episode kind of hits you over the head with the fact that something is off about Clara. And you know that Clara is now a Zygon. Um, so that weren't exactly a massive surprise. Um, when it does happen, yeah, it's a decent plot twist. But you kind of know that it's coming in many ways. I love the Zygon invasion. I think for an Earthbound story, it works really well. The cliffhanger with having the Zygons practically in full control of unit, I think is a great twist um, and just shows that they've lost the battle even before they knew it was coming. Um, so yeah, the Zygon invasion, it's a good story. The Zygon inversion, the perfect way to round off the Zygon invasion, I have to admit. Uh, there are some fantastic moments in the Zygon inversion. Jenna Coleman is given a chance to portray a more twisted version of Clara, as of course Clara is now a Zygon, and I like Coleman's performance. I think she relishes the opportunity to show a new side of Clara, so I think that was great to see. And it also gives the opportunity for the Doctor to pair up with Osgood. And I have to admit, the scenes between the Doctor and Osgood really show how Series 9 was in the need of a new companion. And it could have been Osgood. I think the Doctor and Osgood work very well together. I love how the Doctor is constantly asking Osgood, are you a Zygon or are you a human? I need to know who's on my side. And I think, as Osgood says, you know, by asking that question, you're picking sides. You know, if you don't know who I am, then you just treat me as Osgood. So I think that that was good. I liked those scenes because it showed the Doctor even questioning the Zygon's motives, which I thought was a great thing. Obviously, the main thing people go on about this episode is the war speech. All I will say about the war speech, it's a beautiful piece of dialogue, which is so relevant to the modern world. And having Capaldi... Um, deliver it with such emotion in his performance was a great idea. So the war speech, yeah, probably one of my top 12th Doctor moments because it is a fantastic scene. I like the concept of the Osgood box, the idea that both the humans and Zygons have the ability to, to end the ceasefire and start war and how the Doctor is just trying to make them understand that in, at the end of the day, you will make this decision but it will be innocent people who will pay the price. So I think that's a great idea. A little predictable that the Osgood box turns out to be empty, but it doesn't undermine the conclusion of the episode or the Doctor's fantastic speech. And I like how in the end, the Zygon version of Clara eventually becomes Osgood and decides that she's going to work to maintain peace rather than start war. I think it shows that any character can have redemption in the end as long as you know as long as they haven't done anything too massive they can have redemption in the end and i think one of the main reasons the zygon inversion and this goes for the zygon invasion works so well is because 
It underlines the decision the Doctor nearly had to make on Gallifrey over whether to destroy and end the Time War or not. And I think this episode was literally the Doctor reflecting on that and trying to say that you don't want to do that. You don't want to kill so many people because, of course, he knows what those feelings are like. So, yeah, this episode does a lot of callbacks to the 50th anniversary, which is, of course, great to see. Sleep No More. Oh. Series 9 had some dodgy episodes. Now, the idea of Sleep No More by using found footage is unique. It's novel. It's something different. No one can have a go at it for that. But <laughs> how they dealt with it was terrible. All of the side characters they've introduced, and you may have noticed during series 9, I say that if the side characters are likeable, then it helps the episode a lot. But the side characters they introduce in Sleep No More are boring. They're not even that likeable. I couldn't care less if any of these characters die. I don't even remember any of these characters' names when they do die. So yeah, that's the first issue. These characters are rubbish. Not a massive fan of the Doctor and Clara in this episode either. Clara is once again just so arrogant. Uh, I, by this point I was really getting sick of how arrogant Clara was appearing. I know that's supposed to be the story arc to show how arrogant she's getting, but it just makes her that much more unlikable. So that was an issue with Sleep No More. And obviously the villains having monsters made from sleep dust is is just it's just awful. Um, it, it really is. They're, they're, just, they're just rubbish. <laughs> this is one of the dumbest concepts I've ever heard of. And I don't know if it's just me, but I've watched Sleep No More at, at least five times. And I still don't have a clue how it ends. Like, apparently this was supposed to be a trilogy. Like, they were planning to do further instalments until this one received so much negative coverage. But um, I, I, it just feels like it doesn't end. It's just like it's, it's, it's going and then all of a sudden it's over and that's it. So yeah, Sleep No More, confusing, dumb, the characters are unlikable, and the villains, one of the worst in modern Who. So yeah, not on the top of my list by any means. <laughs> Face the Raven would have been the perfect send-off for Clara, even more than Last Christmas would have been. Um, this episode, it's kind of flawless in many ways. I can't think of a bad moment in it. It takes plenty of time to highlight how arrogant Clara has become. She's become so much like the Doctor now that she literally laughs in the face of danger. And no matter how much the Doctor tries to convince her to not be like that, he's like, hang on, you're getting a bit too carried away now. Clara's just like, oh, it doesn't matter, you know, I'm unstoppable. I'm being like you, that's a great thing. So her comeuppance is kind of clearly foreshadowed you can tell that it's coming i like how they introduce rigsy again a character which of course the doctor and clara already have an established relationship with i feel like introducing a new character wouldn't have worked as well and of course clara is going to take this raven entity from rigsy because she seems to think she's untouchable speaking of the raven very simplistic and yet creepy design. I love its method of killing, how it just enters you and just wipes you out instantly. I think that's a very interesting method of killing. We also get M Return, once again portrayed by Maisie Williams. To be honest, Face the Raven is the only episode I enjoy M as a character. Um, she's given something to do being in charge of this hidden street where loads of the Doctor's old enemies are able to live in peace. So she's at least given something to do, which is more than she did in the other two episodes. Obviously, where this episode starts picking up is when the Doctor realises what Clara has done. The fact that because Rigsy has transferred it to Clara, M can't actually call the Raven off. The Raven requires a soul, so it's going to have to take Clara's. And that leads to some pretty hard to watch scenes, um, but still amazing. Very emotional scenes between the Doctor and Clara. I love the hug they give one another when they finally say their goodbyes. And just the realisation on Clara's face that for the first time, the Doctor can't save her. There's nothing the Doctor can do. So she goes out with her head held high and is killed off. And I, it's the perfect ending. How much I didn't like Clara during Series 9, this death was very meaningful. And it still brings a tear to my eye to this very day. Plus, the Doctor 
is amazing in the aftermath of Clara's death. I love the threat the Doctor gives M, as if to say the the universe is a very small place when I'm angry at you. It's just that very menacing side of the Doctor, which we don't see very often, and it was the perfect way to end the episode. So Face the Raven, a very emotional watch, and if they had had a backbone and kept Clara killed off, would have been the perfect ending for her character. Now, Heaven Sent is an episode which I don't think I'm going to be able to give it the credit it deserves. All I will say about Heaven Sent is from Peter Capaldi's performance to the directing, to the soundtrack, to the set design, to the writing, is some of the strongest in modern Doctor Who. Heaven Sent's a fantastic character piece of the Doctor. Peter Capaldi carries this episode because he's the only character in it, apart from The Shade, which has a simple but yet effective design. It really does produce a sense of fear and the scenes with The Shade do add intensity to the episode. The Doctor having to make confessions in order to stop this Shade from killing him is interesting because obviously we learn more about the Doctor's past. We learn more about... Um, what he's trying to hide from everyone, which is a very interesting concept. I love the scenes where we see inside the Doctor's mind, to have the Doctor and the TARDIS basically telling us how his mind works, how everything he does has a purpose. Like when he jumps out of the window, he shows how just by putting flowers on the floor, he knows what the gravity is like. By throwing chairs out the window, he knows that there's water and how far the drop is going to be. So scenes like that in the TARDIS really showcase how intelligent the Doctor is and gives us a glimpse of what it would be like to be the Doctor. This episode is not only a character assessment of the Doctor, it is also really an episode all about grief. The Doctor is recovering from Clara's traumatic death. He doesn't feel like he can continue on without her. And this episode showcases that even in grief, you have to overcome it and you have to try and press on. And having the Doctor basically being killed for billions of years, punching this diamond to try and get to where he needs to be it just shows how grief can take years to overcome but that doesn't mean you don't give up trying so this episode is not only a great character assessment of the character of the doctor but it also shows the process of grief and how one can attempt to overcome it obviously the cliffhanger to this episode is amazing because the doctor finds his way home he's back on Gallifrey and let's face it, for 10 years, the Revival have been setting up Gallifrey as this place where the Time Lords live and how the Doctor's been trying to get back there. And now he finally is back there. So that was an amazing cliffhanger. Now, I probably haven't give Heaven Sent the credit it deserves, but I cannot stress enough, this is a fantastic episode. One of the best of the modern era, if not the best. And for me, Peter Capaldi is the reason it works so well. If you had any other actor in this role, I, I, I think it would still be good, but not as good as having Capaldi because his passion for Doctor Who as a programme, it just shows on screen during this episode. Hellbent, the series finale. <laughs> to go from the quality of Heaven Sent to the quality of Hell Ben is just shocking. It honestly amazes me that Moffat in one second is able to produce such a fantastic script and then able to produce one of such low quality. Now it gets off to a decent start for a modern Who viewer being able to spend an extended period of time on Gallifrey was interesting. Um, it was interesting to learn more about the planet the Doctor came from. But that is about it in terms of positives for this episode. I don't like how the Doctor just deposes Rassilon because for the simple reason, during the end of time, Rassilon is this very powerful warlike figure who intimidates all the other Time Lords around him. And in this episode, he's just a weak leader who's just deposed very easily. So yeah, I don't know why they chose to do what they did with Rassilon, but for me, it just doesn't work. We learn more about this hybrid and we still ain't got a clue what the hybrid is. Is the hybrid part Time Lord and part Dalek? Or is it part Time Lord and part human? No one really knows. I don't even think Stephen Moffat knows because none of it gets resolved. Plus, I hate the idea that the Doctor left Gallifrey because he knew about this hybrid. Because 
I think that just undermines who the Doctor is as a character. The Doctor left Gallifrey, in my personal opinion, because he was bored. Because he was sick of just sitting there and doing nothing. He wanted to go out and make something of his life. He didn't care about the established rules or narrative. He wanted to be his own person, go out and do his own thing. And I think that's something that anyone can relate to. Having the Doctor just go off because he was scared that this hybrid thing existed just seems a bit pointless. It's one of those things where Moffat attempted to change the law of the show and I still don't understand why because this hybrid storyline never comes up again. But apart from that, for me, the worst part of Hellbent is bringing Clara back because of course you had to. Clara died in Face the Raven so the Doctor goes back in time with the Time Lords and rescues her. Uh, well, temporarily rescues her because Clara still has to die because it's a fixed point in time. But the Doctor decides, no, I'm rescuing Clara with or without you. And he runs off in a TARDIS. Um, and, and this is just weird. This is very unlike the Doctor. I mean, the Doctor shoots someone. I mean, fair enough, they're a Time Lord, they regenerate. But even so, why did the Doctor have to shoot someone? That's just so unlike the Doctor. It was very jarring. I don't understand why the Doctor is literally going to break time for Clara. I just don't think that is necessary at all. It's just something the Doctor, no matter how attached he is to someone, would not do. And I'm sick of Clara by this point. There's no character there. She's just there because Stephen Moffat wants her to be there. And that is about that. It, there's nothing really for Clara to do. I hate that they bring M back because they go to the end of time and of course M is there. Once again, M, there's nothing for her character to do. And then we get the conclusion where the Doctor and Clara decide, well, one of us needs to lose our memory. So they basically throw a dice and it turns out the Doctor is going to lose his memories of Clara. So Clara and M can go travelling off in one of the most poorly CGI'd American diners I have ever seen in my life. And that is something I never thought I would say. Yeah, I, I hate it that Clara and M basically go off travelling in a TARDIS and Clara is is now a doctor, I'm assuming. Uh, it's just a, such a terrible end for the character, which undermines f the conclusion of Face the Raven. Plus, I, it, it undermines the doctor as well, because now the doctor... He's he's lost his memories of Clara. He knows of her, but that's about it. So yeah, I'm I'm not very happy with that. Um, the only decent thing this episode ends with is we get the return of the sonic screwdriver. Um, throughout series nine, we have the sonic sunglasses, and for me personally, they are a terrible invention, and they should have never returned. Um, <laughs> so it's good to see the sonic screwdriver back, and it's good to see parts of Gallifrey. But apart from that, everything else in this episode. Absolutely abysmal. And to round off series nine, we have the 2015 Christmas special, The Husbands of River Song. Now, I feel like this episode is a Marmite episode. Some people like it, some people hate it. For me, it's all right. I mean, it's not really my cup of tea. I like how it's the first Christmas special which is not set on Earth, it's fully set on an alien world. I think that's a really interesting idea and something unique about this special. I really enjoy the scene between the Doctor and River Song. Um, Peter Capaldi and Alex Kingston quickly form a very strong relationship on screen. You can tell that there's chemistry there. They have a lot of funny and memorable moments as well. Peter Capaldi carries this entire episode for me. I love when the Doctor enters the TARDIS and obviously River doesn't recognise the Doctor at all. So the Doctor's like, well, I'm going to show how a TARDIS reveal should be done. And th that scene's just amazing. I, I still laugh out loud when I see it because Capaldi's just a, such a fantastic actor. And this was so how the Doctor would react given this situation to see in the TARDIS. So yeah, scenes like that do raise this episode up in quality. And it needs it because the plot of this episode is what lets it down. River being married to this cyborg known as Hydroflax is, is, is pretty stupid. To be honest, Hydroflax is a very over-the-top villain. I suppose you could get away with it in a more light-hearted Christmas episode. But, you know, apart from that, he's not exactly that memorable. And that goes for a lot of the episode. A lot of the episode is just... The Doctor and River Song walking around and the Doctor trying to make River Song 
remind her that of who he is. And that is pretty much about it. Now, this episode does pick up during the last 10 to 15 minutes. I love the reveal of River Song finally realising that the person she's been travelling with is the Doctor, with the Doctor simply saying, hello, sweetie. I think that's a great moment. Helps in part because of the two actors involved. And I also love how this episode kind of brings to a close River Song's story with having the Doctor finally take her to this hotel on Derillium where they can see the great scenery and where the Doctor's like, you know, I can't say that this is the last time we're going to meet, but it could well be. And I think that's a great moment. Um, I love how it turns out that a night on Derillium is actually... I think it's 26 years. I want to say 26 years, but don't quote me on that because that was just such a great moment. And Alex Kingston kills it in her final scenes as River Song. That's the one thing I can't have a go at Moffat about. He does know how to conclude a character's storyline in an emotional way, you know. So I'm quite happy if we don't see River Song again because she got the perfect send off. And I love the final shot of the Doctor and River just looking in each other's eyes, and then it just ends. I think that was the perfect way to end River Song's character. Glad it ended on a Christmas special as well. I might not be a massive fan of this episode as a whole. But the standout moments are really strong and emotional moments. So in conclusion, Series 9 is definitely a unique series of Doctor Who for the simple reason it's mostly two-parters, which is something Doctor Who has not done before. So of course that makes this series stand out. And some of these two-parters are great. Under the Lake, Before the Flood, The Zygon Invasion, The Zygon Inversion and Heaven Sent are really strong episodes. It's just a, sa a shame that some of the others are very poor, such as The Girl Who Died, The Woman Who Lived, Sleep No More, and of course, Hell Bent. Series 9, as I said in my introduction, is a mixed bag series for me. Some of the parts of it I really enjoy, and other parts are abysmal. Peter Capaldi carries this series as the Doctor. He's fantastic, and while I have problems with how um, the writers chose to go with the Doctor in this series, it doesn't undermine Capaldi's performance in the least. If anything, Capaldi's performances save scripts, um, especially, you know, even though I don't enjoy, uh, for example, The Girl Who Died, Capaldi's performance during aspects of that episode are still very strong. The main reason I have with Series 9 is not the story arc of the hybrid, which doesn't seem to go anywhere, it's the companion in the form of Clara Oswald. Clara was a companion I enjoyed in Series 7 and Series 8. By Series 9, there was nowhere for this character to go. Moffat decided to make her very arrogant, to show how she was taking risks. She was becoming too much like the Doctor. But the problem with that characterization was it made her very unlikable. There are so many moments during this series when I just want to tell Clara to shut up and let the Doctor get on with it, because the Doctor knows what he's doing. So, Series 9. For me, up until this point, the worst series of Modern Who... On rewatch, it's a lot better than I remember it being, but my pre-existing problems with this series still stand. So that is why Doctor Who Series 9 gets a well-deserved Firewood ranking, because it might be nice to look at, you're enjoying it at the time, but sooner or later it starts burning out and you're just left disappointed. So thanks for watching guys, I really do hope you enjoyed this review. Please remember to like, comment and subscribe in order to receive great and maybe even improved quality content in the future. Now of course, after the Husbands of River Song in 2015, Doctor Who took a year break and returned in the 2016 Christmas special. Now, was it an improvement? Well, you're going to have to wait to hear my opinions on that. So I hope you enjoyed and I will see you in another one. See ya!